Hey guys. Well, in my investigation of my estate and Mudfred buildings and buildings in general, I've become quite fascinated with bricks. The making of bricks, how they got them here, and um, the composition of bricks. <laughs> it's crazy, I know, but it's where research takes you, isn't it? So, um, watching Martin's... Uh, great video last night, Martin Lietke, Flat Earth British, and he was looking at um, where some of these massive buildings in um, America was the granite, you know, somehow derived from something that was a bit off. So what I've done, I've sort of like been having a little look about. Um, this is by no means meant to be like a comprehensive um, or conclusive uh, study. It's just trying to establish some sort of connection between bricks, mortar, and maybe the use of bone in there, human bone, animal bone, just bone. So I found um, quite a few sites about bricks. I'm just putting my other glasses on, you have to excuse me. So this is a bit of a sort of like um a, a bit of a jollyly written one from the Londonist. And they talk about how, you know, wonderful squares of Notting Hill and all this, that and the other. But they give quite a good sort of like um description of how London is pretty much made out of itself. It's its own clay. Uh, they used combustible domestic waste or soil, the ash and cinders of the city, to provide the organic material. And they dig everything out by hand. And in a summer, a single group of labourers could produce a million bricks. And what they'd do, they'd put the kilns up in a field and they'd make the bricks and sort of like dig the field up and then when they'd finish they'd cover it all over and move on. It just sounds like a bit of a, a way to do it. So they've got this picture up here by George Cruikshank, 1829 sketch. London going out of town or the march of bricks and mortar in which a band of robotic toolmen march on London's rural outposts, a surge of brick terraces springing up in their wake. Dome of St. Paul's peeks out from behind a barrage of new houses, while a volcanic kiln spews bricks onto hapless trees and haystacks. Now, I've actually got a better picture of it than that, this one here. This is a colour photo. So, I was interested in a couple of things in this. For a start, that's not a kiln, that's a pyramid. These are kilns, that's a kiln. That's a kiln. That's a pyramid. And chucking all these bricks out onto these haystacks. And there's a lots of bits of writing which is very difficult to read. It's just a slightly countryside running away from the onslaught. But these these houses are wrecked. Look. They're all cracked. It's cracked and they're being held up, shored up here cracked and they're also built on arches which I think is very strange they're built up on arches and this almost looks like water doesn't it or mud flood it's all coming in and it's all wrecking all this and here we have these this looks like skull and crossbones here this is St Paul's and it looks like it's on fire. So everything's on fire. And there looks like a mud flood. And they're building. And this here going on. So, yeah, I thought that was um, a little bit of a, a bit of a strange one. So let's go back. That's a kiln. And there's um, 
more accounts here of people just sort of genuine, genuinely sort of complaining about how the countryside was being eaten up. And we got this here. This is um, traditional brickwork. Despite being renowned for its durability, problems in brickwork can be very serious. Bah, bah, bah. Brick construction in Britain dates from the Roman period. Clay was dug and allowed to weather over winter or sometimes over several winters until it had been broken down by frost. I mean, this is the early clay. And generally stone was being used, especially for large and high status buildings. However, after the Great Fire of London in 1666, they um, decided they wanted to build in brick from then on. So they built Bell Hall. Now this is quite interesting for what we're looking at. Bell Hall at Neighbour, New York, epitomises the growing trend for building in brick in England. Built on a stone undercroft. A stone undercroft. Okay, so an undercroft is one of these. It's a traditionally a cellar or a storage room, often brick lined and vaulted and used for storage in buildings since medieval times. Hmm. So, yeah, so one of the first brick buildings was built on a stone undercroft. And then they go back to talk about the different kilns. And I think it's down here, this one, they've got the recipe. That's nice, isn't it? Okay, right, so it's not that one. Maybe this one. Excuse me, I had it all lined up and started to do it and somebody knocked the door. So. Oh yeah, this is somebody put this up. This is uh, about um, a builder. A brickie, a brickie and all the brickmakers in a particular area. Well, that was quite a, a, a interesting. It's quite a process that was making handmade bricks and then they um it's a huge kiln scotch kiln There's some early brick makers and then they got into machine pressing like this So um, here we have the general sort of composition of the brick. So silica, 55%, alumina, 30%, iron oxide, 8%, magnesium, 5%, lime, 1%, organic matter, 1%. So they don't need a lot of lime in your average brick, do you? Okay, so silica, clay, alumina is the main constitute, constituent cementing material, silica, lime, you should contain a little amount of fine powdered lime, as it enables silica to melt at the furnace temperature and iron oxide, and that's what gives it all the bricks are red colour, yeah. Too much lime can melt the brick. They've got to um, burn the carbon dioxide off, I think. Okay. So bricks have got lime in them. So let's have a look at mortar. So the history of lime in mortar. The first mortars are made from mud and clay. It was discovered that limestone, when burnt and combined with water, produced a material that would harden with age. Mortars could 
obtaining only lime and sand required carbon dioxide from the air. So, Joseph Aspdin, an English mason builder, patented a material called Portland cement in 1824. So here he is. This guy was a brickie, living in Leeds. He set up his own business and he experimented with cement manufacturing and worked out how to make bricks. How to make um, cement with a new modified recipe for cement making, the first modern cement. And this is called artificial stone. And this is his patent here. My method of making a cement or artificial stone for stuccoing buildings, waterwork systems, or any other purpose to which it may be applicable, and which I call Portland cement, is as follows. I take a specific quantity of limestone, such as that generally used for making or repairing roads, and I take it from the roads after it is reduced to a puddle or powder. So he scrapes it from the roads. Then he breaks it down and it tells you how he makes it. But they say here that the limestone that he used was the Pennine Carboniferous limestone, which was used for paving the streets. The characteristic practice of the patent and of his lime patent is the use of road sweepings. Road sweepings. He says if the sweepings are not available, he obtains the limestone itself and he was twice prosecuted for digging up whole paving blocks on the local roads. <laughs> Limestone supply was clearly a major headache for him. Okay, so I got to thinking, what else do they make uh, these bone for? I was thinking about bone meal, and I remembered bone china. So I had a look at ceramics. Yeah. Bone ash makes up about 50% by weight of fine bone china. Typical analysis for calcined bone is 67 to 85% calcium phosphate, 3 to 10% calcium carbonate, and small amounts of CaO and CaF2. So CaO is lime, quick lime, yeah? So I did a little bit more digging about. And I found this question. Is there any truth to the idea I've heard that the ancient Romans used bone or bone meal in making concrete? And somebody says, no, there wasn't enough to make the abundance of concrete the Romans used in all their building. Oh, and then this guy pops up. David Wilmshurst, technical manager Materials Consultancy and Lab. Okay. So he said, Is there any truth to the idea I've heard that the ancient Romans used bone or bone meal in making concrete? Absolutely possible, despite what my kids would have you believe. However, I wasn't there, so cannot act as a witness. Calcined bone is typically 55 or so percent CAO, a.k.a. quicklime. The rest is largely phosphorus pentoxide. Strangely, not. Bones, etc. are where limestone came from. <sighs> okay, interesting. So what, what have I got here? Ah, yeah. The scientists discovered the secret recipe of Roman concrete. So the secret recipe was volcanic sand. That's what they found. Volcanic sand and lumps of volcanic rocks, so they ground it down. But they still have lime in there. Everybody has lime. Lime's still in there. And then I found this. This is great. The influence of CaO and P2O5 on bone ash upon the reactivity and the burnability of cement raw mixtures. So... The introduction. The main concerns of cement industry and cement researchers are and will remain the energy savings, environmental protection and pollution control. To achieve these goals, cement industry and relative sectors are developing constantly the concept of use of alternative fuels and raw materials in the production of clinkers and final cements. 
So clinkers is the um, product that's there. When you fired it, it's like small pebbly things. So give it all a little bit down here. And then he says, one of these alternative fuels that could be considered as alternative raw materials are the meat bone meal, referred as meal beet bone, <laughs> meal bone meat, <laughs> MBM, or other processed veterinary wastes of animal origin. origin. The cement rotary kiln reaches high temperature needed to affect degradation of biological wastes. The ash of the meat bone meal is composed mostly of P2O5, that's your um, phosphorus thing, and CAO, which is uh, mostly in the form of calcium phosphate. So there's your lime. So then they give you a lot of information about the study, how they had it done into two or three different groups, fired at different temperatures, the aim of the present investigation is to show that the bone meal can be utilised not only as alternative fuel but also as a source of material, alternative material. The ash of bone meal contains CAO so it can be used as partial substitution of limestone. The calculation of CAO fraction from the ash of bone meal into the total CAO account balance in the cement raw meal will enable to combust higher amount of the bone meal to reduce the CO2 emission and to save one of the basic raw material in production of cement, limestone. So yeah, these guys are saying that you can. You can make limestone or lime out of bone. So, the Romans. Now this is where it really starts to dovetail into what I'm looking at as well. Ancient Roman burial practices. So the Romans were obsessed with death. Because so I've been looking up um, ancient guilds, which seem to go back to the Roman collegiate. And they were obsessed with death. They had burial clubs. Unbelievable. So Romans could bury or burn their dead. Practices known as inhumation, burial, and cremation, burning. But at certain times, one practice was preferred over another, and family traditions might resist current fashions. So in the last 100 years of the Republic, cremation was the most common. Yeah. So they were burning their dead. They had a terror of death. And they had these um, special places. Hang on, let me... See if they mention it here. It's all about burials, and this is where we burial outside the city limits. Here we are. So we had Collegia Funeratitia, funeral societies, Col Columbaria, resting places for the ashes of members of the Collegia. They were absolutely, completely obsessed with death. And who does that remind you of? So, <clears throat> hey guys. Well, um, I thought I'd do um, a little bit of a, a bolt on to that video. Uh, I was going to do a whole new video. In fact, this might come out as a whole new video. It all depends how long it's going to take. Because I know that, you know, we've all got... Um, different things to do. Anyway, I was watching um, uh, Kathy's video. This is Obsidian Alice, previously Jack's fan, and uh, I an mean, amazing video. It, it, I, I, I connected so many dots and and um, I've been looking at bricks and uh, red bricks and houses for a while now and I sort of in and out of the research, you know, but when I saw this, she triggered me to um, start looking again. Because she um, talks about this chapel here. And when it was built, 
in 1776, they found thousands and thousands of skulls and bones and they ended up interring them in this chapel. And it didn't house the deceased from a church cemetery. Thousand people interred in the basement. So as you can see, the chapel was built in 1776, but it was to house people who died long before that. So the, the church itself has nothing, and the ossuary itself, it wasn't collecting bones from local churches right there for up and, and you know we're going to have to sort of turn the ground now so that's not what it was doing so this is a chandelier made of bones in the Sedlik ossuary in the Czech Republic I don't feel right okay so I sort, sort of thought to myself what if and I have thought this before, what if um, these red bricks are basically just us? What if they are just us, man? You know? And in my video here, I look at the um, ingredients of bricks. So we have silica, alumina, iron oxide, magnesia, lime, organic matter. And that's your sort of basic mix-up. and different um, materials used to provide these right so uh, I'm hoping that all of this research that I've got here is all going to be in order we'll give it a go okay so this definition of um, clay here is a fine grained firm earthy material it is plastic when wet and hardens when heated, consisting primarily of hydrated silicates of aluminium and widely used in making bricks, tiles and pottery. A hardening or non-hardening material, having a consistency similar to clay and used for modelling. A sedimentary material with grains smaller than 0.002mm. Moist, sticky earth, mud, the human body as opposed to the spirit. Yeah? There's another one here. So um, there are references to man being um, from clay. I can't find the other definition that I had now. But yeah, man as clay. So here is the chemical constitution of people. There's lots and lots here. Some are more comprehensive than others. This one is quite a good one. So we have all of these. Oh, gold. Sorry. God, it's double the size. It does this. We have all of these elements inside us, yeah? And over here, this is this alum aluminia thing. That's in. We have that. Not a lot, but we have it. We have everything. We have all these, and these are the ones we don't have. Here's another one. This one shows it a bit better. Here it is. Aluminium. So we do have aluminium in there. Boron, carbon, nitrogen. So all of these elements are in our bodies. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Silicon, so this is our silica. And the silica in our bodies is the same sort of silica that is found in um, the clay. What's this next one? So here's the seven stages of alchemy. Now, um, if you consider that a human being is a completed form, and maybe this was an age when nothing went to waste, nothing went to waste. What a waste of a, a human being just to shove it in the ground and leave it. And the alchemical process takes you from one of lead and 
eventually you go through this process which includes putrefaction and then a distillation into coagulation yeah there's a great line here and I bet I can't find it it says something about you go from the body to the spirit to form so they actually release they're thinking they're releasing the spirit and they talk about the reddening the reddening which expands spirit to matter reflecting the competition through the color royal purple red I just find it all connected here I just I just and also the Sun the Sun in alchemy is sulfur uh, anyway that aside I'm going to leave all the links to these uh, alchemical human process now I don't know how they did it obviously this was done a while ago I think we were more than just some commodity but um, I, I had a comment under my video and there's one under um, Kathy's as well I believe so I'll have a look there's one under mine from Liz in Dublin I remember years ago driving through a town in County Kildare and someone said about one building that they used ox and blood in the mix to make it strong yeah and let's check Kathy's. it might be on this one or it might be on her Paul Cook one because Paul mirrored it. Uh, it might not be here anyway a similar thing a similar thing so why did the ancient Romans add blood to their concrete mixes what benefit does blood do to the properties of the resulting com concrete although few good books mention that Romans mix blood and fat and concrete and the theory is dubious yet assuming they did mix I'm putting forth the reasons why they may may have done this have you ever got a deep cut so the blood gushes out what do you do in such a situation just hold that place of pressure and blood will make a clot so this guy thought they put blood immediately down so that everything stuck somebody else talks about how the fat in the um, body contributes to the actual um, waterproof situation of it this sort of soapy thing that goes on I don't know if they had some um, you see if they used our blood right here's our bricks and here we've got a bit of a history how they've been used since the dawn of civilization uh, Great Wall of China this is just you know the medieval cities were of wood and because of the disastrous fire potential of wood the bricks replaced the wood over the years for instance the great fire of London in 1666 changed London from being a city of wood to one of brick um, well as we know our history is all over the place so I don't know about that it's an age-old material and um, brickwork versus stonework and um, bricks are very hot right now I watched um, a video with autodidactics Campbell and Colm Gibney the other day and they were talking there they were sort of like theorizing on how old these things are and Colm didn't um, uh, sort of um, incriminate himself in any way <laughs> but he alluded to the age of these star not forts maybe star city citadel city states I don't know and uh, he, I don't know I don't know I, to me I'm thinking thousands of years not hundreds of years uh, genuinely and um, also um, I know UAP has been looking at bricks and also black sheep researcher as I mentioned in my previous vid to these to this one and the other one is um, talks about these um, star places star forts having a uh, these these are uh, ossuaries this is um, I looked into putrefaction and everything looking at this 
because when you putri when a body dies it goes through um, a process this guy here this was written in the 1840s and he says nobody wants to study it because it's disgusting <laughs> so he talks about it so it has to for a body to putrefy in a certain way certain situations have to be in place so it has to be dead water must be present in sufficient quantities to permit the free motion of it putrefying temperature has to be constant neither too high nor too low oxygen has to be present and there should be no powerful chemical agent now if as i sort of suspect they drained our bodies of blood it would have had to have been done while we were still living otherwise it doesn't flow as soon as your heart stops your blood stops flowing which is why when you die blood pools and if you watch mud fossil university and he talks about his mud fossils how they are often flattened on the bottom where the blood has pooled yeah so in a um, putrefying body that has had its blood removed you're not going to have the same process so I think maybe they removed the um, the blood, dried it, so blood meal. Blood meal is a dry inert powder made from blood, used as a high, there's blood, there's some blood in case you don't know what blood is, used as a high nitrogen organic fertilizer and it's a slaughterhouse byproduct. And here it is. Iron oxides are chemical compounds composed of iron and oxygen. There are 16 known iron oxides and oxyhydroxides, the best known of which is rust, a form of iron oxide. Yeah. And the colour of iron oxide can go from this sort of very dark brown to a very sort of like vivid red. In fact, let's have a look. iron oxide images yeah see so you can buy it you can buy um, blood meal people use it on their gardens this is a little bit I, I'm gonna come to that in a bit right clinkers I mentioned clinkers in um, my other video. Clinkers, uh, when you have a brick that doesn't come out properly, it comes out as a clinker brick and they're all misshapen. And people use them to make these sort of interesting, sort of scatty, eccentric walls and houses with odd, odd bricks. I clinker built, they say something's clinker built. And clinkers are... Um, a, a, a sort of a waste product of making bricks and concrete and this is cement clinker cement clinker is a solid material produced in the manufacture of Portland cement now it's difficult to make the transition between thinking about this modern stuff here and how they're doing it now and how they were doing it back then because they were doing the same thing. Now, if they were using us, they, they needed cement as well as bricks. So um, maybe there was a double process. I can, I can quite easily see that a body with its blood removed and allowed to putrefy would eventually sort of like descend into some earthy clay material. And I think they probably had a way of hastening the process. And at some point, maybe they just removed bones and there are quite a few accounts of these disarticulated skeletons being found that are missing skulls and, and long bones so maybe they did that and maybe the rest of the bones were used in the actual process and ended up as clinker because they weren't needed or they removed extraneous bones is that the right word? bones that weren't needed and smashed them up and shoved them in pits because cement clinker right let's have a look at some pictures if you just put clinkers in you get these Cadbury's chocolates Cadbury's have got a, a chocolate called the clinkers 
cement clink. If you look at cement clinker, this is cement clinker, and it's always between two and three and a half to four millimeters round. And then you look at white gravel. It's not an awful lot of difference between them, is there? But gravel, of course, has been dug from the ground and has been there for a while. And not all gravels either, because there are different types of gravel. I think if there is, if it is one, it's going to be this one, fine gravel. Gravel consisting of particles with a diameter of 2 to 8 millimetres. And gravel, if you take the L off, is grave. So maybe it's not gravel pits, maybe it's grave pits. Similarly, there's clay pits everywhere where people dig them out and then they, they have been turned into ponds. So I don't know. So I found this as well. Charnel houses, charnel grounds. There's not many of these in the world and they're not very nice. It's where people go to leave their dead. They just leave them out. They just leave them out to die. And there's not much information about them. And they're supposed to be ghastly places full of vultures, hyenas, jackals, rotting bodies and um, extreme meditation is to go into one of these places and actually meditate within the charnel ground amongst these sort of uh, rotting bodies. So this is wikis. A charnel ground um, is an above ground site for the putrefaction putrefaction of bodies, generally human, where former living tissue is left to decompose uncovered. Although it may have demarcated locations within it functionally identified as burial grounds, cemeteries and crematoria, it is distinct from these as well as from crypts or burial vaults. Sorry guys, obviously huge apologies for that. Um, so yeah, charnel houses, charnel grounds, places where uh, bodies are just left out to, to rot quite often because people can't afford to uh, bury their dead they take them to this charnel ground in the Himalaya where tillable topsoil for burial and fuel for cremation is scarce and a valuable commodity the location of a so-called sky burial is identified with a charnel ground so a, a sky burial is a funeral practice where a human corpse is placed on a mountain to decompose while exposed to the elements or to be eaten by scavenging animals, especially carrion birds. That's what I've said I'll always do. If I found out I was going to die, I'd clear off to um, the highlands of Scotland and just lay myself out. Let the golden eagles get me. So this is... Uh, a video that Roger from Mud Fossils University put up in 2019. I remember seeing it at the time. Ground up bodies used in construction. And this is ancient China. And here is a giant with a mashing wheel. And there's bodies here. And he has a, quite a few of these videos where he talks about bodies being used in construction, looking at granite and marble and pointing out the different cons cons constituents, components, the minerals. And not to forget another brick in the wall where they're shoving the bodies into here, the red brick school. And, uh, you know, it makes me wonder is, d d does the human body when taken down to its um, components with the bones removed and the blood removed weigh the same as a brick are we all just bricks in in walls where 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 we all just commodities I, I just it just it's just beyond me and I watched a little bit of Martin last night and he put this up this picture up And it's horrible. It's just awful. It's dark, dark, dark. 
It's an album cover from a band called Void of Sleep. And this is the, the architect with the trowel, with blood on his hand, with blood on the trowel, and here's all the all the souls beneath his feet. This apron, I don't know what the apron signifies, maybe it signifies they don't get blood on them or something, but So, I don't know guys, are the buildings us? Are the bricks us? Were we part of the deal? Did the, did we um, have to be virtually bled out? Because if, if you think about a body putrefying, once the constituent parts are taken out, the blood and the bone, what you've got left is a slippery mess, which under certain um, processes alchemically could become material needed for um, for bricks or they could burn us burn the bones out remove the bones burn them so far take out the bones they need burn them further down break the bones up chuck them in a pit or just leave them in the in the mess leave them in the in the mire in the mud in the clay Anyway, let me know what you think. Uh, it's just like the logical progression from lime being used in, in concrete to um, our blood being used. I think they probably added it. You know, they added it afterwards. Oh, and the other thing is the hearth in the house. Now, a hearth in a house is the central area in the house the hearth the fireplace basically where everybody gathers around but it's a little bit more than that there's the wiki thing right all right take the h off hearth and you get heart it's a brick or stone lined fireplace with or without an oven used for heating and originally used for cooking food and also used for cooking food for centuries the hearth was such an integral part of a home usually its central most important feature the concept has been generalized to refer to a home place or household as in the terms hearth and home heart and home and keep the home fires burning and there's the different hearths medieval hearth and hearth tax why would they be taxing it they taxed you if you had a hearth so did they use the heart in the hearth, heart stone that they put in front of the fire? I just don't know. Anyway, let me know what you think, guys. I know it's all a bit uh, crazy, but it's crazy now. Thanks for watching.